Hello everybody! <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the fourth annual Creativity Conference uh, at the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. I'm Randy Oksher, one of the co-directors of this institute, and this conference is sponsored this year as it always is by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and its affiliated societies. They have, we decided, I'm part of that organization, and we decided some years ago to move our central division APA meeting here because we're getting bigger crowds here than we were at the central APA. And indeed, uh, what we have discovered is that the sort of mis mission of the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity is greatly forwarded by this format as opposed to meeting at an American Philosophical Association meeting. Um, where there are so many other groups that are highlighted. Plus, this enables us to record. I have to thank Troy Brown, who is our regular videographer, and today he is doing a lot more than he usually does because this is our first. We've been online and we've been in person, but this is our first conference that's both online and in person, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys that that increases the level of complexity significantly. We have a limited, by invitation only, audience. <laughs> limited to 10. And uh, these are mostly fellows of the AIPCT and students of philosophy at uh, uh, SIU Carbondale. And so uh, we're pleased to have them here. The only way that the audience will be able to ask questions is by putting it in the chat. But with any luck, Sabrina can monitor that and tell us what the questions are. So I also want to thank Sabrina Hardenberg, a fellow of the AIPCT and all-around great person who is helping Troy out with uh, the multi-complex thing of having a both hybrid, uh, well, both an in-person and online conference at the same time. So we got four papers today, uh, and I'm really tickled that our keynote speech is to be done by Robert Innes, Professor Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and somebody I have known for a long time, and whose work I have admired for, since even before I knew him, uh, and have in recent years gotten to know quite well. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to call him a friend as well as a colleague and somebody I respect. A great mentor to those of us who have the strange habit of crossing semiotics with pragmatism and process philosophy, but also, in Bob's case, with uh, psychology and aesthetics and a number of other uh, things. Um, uh, Bob has a bunch of books that I'm not going to list, but I am pleased to say that his most recent book, is it still your most recent book? Because they keep coming yeah. up. His most recent book appeared in the series that's edited by uh, me and John Shook uh, uh, associated with this institute, which is the State University of New York Press series in American Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Sounds just like the name of the institute, doesn't it? All right, and anyway, I felt that our series was extremely fortunate to get Bob's manuscript, and it's just appeared, and so, but I know you have another book that is just on the verge of appearing, too, so uh, uh, we won't... We won't have the privilege of, uh, of calling it our most recent book for very long, or your most recent book for very long. But anyway, so without further delay, uh, let's go to uh, Bob Ennis, and he has interesting and important things to say to us today. Welcome, Bob. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, one thing you uh, did not mention about the recent book is that uh, it was published on a very ominous day, uh, on April Fool's Day. Um, so uh, that was the official date of publication. So I hope that that does not uh, uh, threaten something, the reception group of, uh, of what is going to be the case. Uh, my talk today was not prepared explicitly for this, uh, for this meeting, but it, it was, uh, turns out that it is explicitly dedicated to the types of things that this meeting is is meant to, to deal with. It's a paper that I uh, had prepared for a, 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 a philosophical discussion group that meets once a year that dealt with the issue of freedom and liberation. And in the course of preparing the, the paper on freedom and liberation, I realized I had absolutely nothing to write about freedom and, and liberation. And, and I tried to figure out why not. And that led me to uh, the difficult problem that many of us have, uh, namely of trying to find some new thing to say 
that is philosophy assimilates the whole philosophical tradition, but all of us seem to have this burden of needing to say something new, even if we're saying something new about the, the old. So uh, I found then that um, this was not a problem alone with me, that this is a general problem. And, uh, and it came from reading uh, Goethe's uh, Maxim and Reflections, and also uh, my encounter with the small book by Robert Richardson on uh, Emerson uh, to, uh, with the title of uh, First We Read and Then We Write. So what I have here uh, is uh, uh, about a 14 page paper. It'll take about 35 minutes or so, I guess, to read uh, that deals with this, uh, what uh, Emerson called the petulant demand to be creative or to be original and what it means, why, why we carry this burden with us to try to voice something new um, uh, and uh, constantly adding to the uh, deposit of, 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 of creative events, while at the same time, perhaps realizing that it's not really up to us. So the title of the paper is Paradoxical Burden of Creativity and Originality. There are three parts. First called Framing Creativity and Originality between Goethe and Emerson. Uh, the second part deals with beneath creativity, namely uh, what are the processes that lie under it? Since creativity we often see only in terms of its results, but the real issue is out of what matrices, out of what jumble of processes does creative activity emerge? And, uh, so the second part of, of, the, of the talk will deal with those issues. And then the third part will give some extensions, some uh, exemplifications from uh, uh, very different uh, 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 fields, from the fields of architecture and painting, uh, cultural anthropology, et cetera, to, uh, to lead us uh, to, uh, to some sort of understanding of, uh, of what we should be doing. So part one on framing creativity and originality between Goethe and Emerson. In Goethe's Maxims and Reflections, we find the following ent ent uh, entries. Goethe writes, the most original authors of the day are not rated as such because they produce something new, but only because they are capable of saying this kind of thing as though it had never been said before. A following maxim says, that is why the most attractive mark of originality is knowing how to develop a received idea so creatively that no one can easily guess how much lies hidden within it. As to these ideas, whatever they may be, such as freedom and liberation, where I was fundamentally stumped, many ideas, Goethe says, appear only quite gradually, like flowers opening out among the greenery of the branches. When roses are in bloom, one sees roses in bloom everywhere. On this account, there are seasons even for creative or new ideas. But Goethe offers a further specification. In the end, all depends on attitudes, for there are mental attitudes ideas follow, and ideas are in keeping with attitudes. Such attitudes are essentially habits, and habits arise from practices. And, and as a matter of fact, then, what we have to ask, can the production of original ideas be practiced or cultivated? What is involved in such practices? For Goethe, the greatest genius, he writes, is not worth much if he pretends to draw exclusively from his own resources. Genius, in the sense intended by Goethe, is, he says, the faculty of seizing and turning to account anything that strikes us. Indeed, he contended that closely scrutinized the productions of artistic genius are for the most part reminiscences. And these reminiscences are rooted in the practices of the, what he calls the art of appropriation. As he wrote in entry 441 of Maxims and Reflections, he says, there's nothing clever that hasn't been thought of before. You've just got to think it all over again. Thinking something all over again is one of the permanent tasks of philosophical reflection. But clearly one can think something all over again, such as the nature and scope of creativity, only if one has in some sense been brought to thought 
whether theoretically or in our practices. The job here is to think over or rotate creativity, clearly a general and multi-dimensional notion of great and contentious breadth and depth. But even here, Goethe issues a stark warning, at least for me, as I wrestled with the difficulty of framing my point of entry into our theme. He says, general notions and great conceit are always potential creators of shocking misfortune. Where does that leave us at this conference, a diverse yet remarkably compatible mixture of different temperaments and deeply shared interests? What does that, where does that leave me? As Goethe also remarked, one can recognize the usefulness of an idea and yet fail to understand just how to make the best use of it. Why is that the case if it is? Could we not first of all try to articulate or arrive at the essential features and types of creativity, perhaps through definitional stipulation or through a vast catalog of exemplary instances both individual and social. But here Goethe notes, we encounter a double-faced problem or challenge. All empiricists, he writes, are on the search for ideas and cannot discover them in multiplicity. All theorists are looking for them in multiplicity and fail to discover them there. The contrast between empiricists and theorists characterizes central aspects of the approach I will take to the theme we are exploring in this meeting, how to approach and frame and exemplify creativity and originality. Are we caught in a perpetual oscillation between the empirical and the theoretical? Sapere alde, we are told, we are urged on every front to be creative, to find our own original voice, to say something new about vitally important topics, to speak out from where we are in ways not heard before, to produce works of art and take on forms of agency that shift the relational context, both individual and social, in which we carry out our lives. But Goethe, in spite of his remarkable creative and intellectual powers, makes no attempt to turn creativity and originality into some sort of fetishistic demand that we have to fulfill by a kind of liberating exercise of autonomous thought or artistic production or ethical actions. Cognate linked, linked aspects are found in the set of remarks by Emerson, provoked by his encounter with and deep admiration for Goethe. Emerson was, was himself famously absorbed by the problem of originality and creativity. In one of his well-known passages, which I think everybody here has read maybe 25 times, uh, he asked the question, why should we not have an original relation to the universe? Why should we not have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition and a religion of revelation to us and not the history of theirs? Robert Richardson in his uh, the book that I mentioned uh, before, first we read, then we write, writes that Emerson wanted original accounts, firsthand experience, personal witness, insisting at the same time that Emerson did not deny new thoughts or the original contribution of others. They were to be measured by how much they could give back to one's own consciousness. Such thoughts and contributions arise from the type of activity, both receptive and productive, that is the work or workings of genius, an activity, Emerson asserts, which repairs the decays of things. Paradigmatically, the decays of our vital sense of life, both individual and social. This is the type of writing and practices of reading that Emerson himself engaged in with his lifelong attempts to write against the pressing weight of his realization, growing out of his encounters with Shakespeare, Goethe, and others, that all originality is relative. Every thinker is retrospective, not in the sense that the past is the explicit focus of their thinking, but rather that it furnishes the unavoidable background, enabling conditions and analytical resources upon which the thinker relies to focus on the present. Dewey calls this condition fundedness, the capital the mind has at its disposal to engage the world an active and eager background, he says, that lies in wait and engages whatever comes its way so as to absorb it into its own being. 
its animus is toward further interactions. In the opening lines of his, Shakespeare, of his essay on Shakespeare, Emerson writes, great men are more distinguished by range and extent than by originality. The greatest genius is the most indebted man. Such indebtedness, he says, makes a mockery of our petulant demand for originality from which we need to be freed. For Emerson, even occasional poems can be used to give leave to originality. We have, he writes, a, a permanent debt to tradition through reading and conversation, such that, as he says, there is no pure originality. All minds quote, old and new make the warp and woof of every moment. There is no thread, there's not a twist of these two strands. By necessity, by proclivity, and by delight, we all quote. End of quote. So what is originality for Emerson? It is being, being oneself and reporting accurately what we see and are. Genius is, in the first instance, sensibility, he says, the capacity for receiving just impressions from the external world and the power of coordinating these after the laws of thought. In this, Emerson concurs with Goethe's foregrounding of openness to what strikes and lures one. Scientific originality is a distinctive and highly developed example of this. It is measured against different conceptual frameworks and backgrounds of competing or merely postulated theories and unexplained phenomena that cannot be situated within existing frameworks or even pinned down for technical experimental reasons. Rosamond Harding, in her classic book, An Anatomy of, in of Inspiration, provocatively proposed that while the scientist creates a discovery, the artist discovers a creation. In this way, linking science and art as, in different ways to, as pathways to discovery. If then, as Emerson holds, the greatest genius, no matter in what field, is the most indebted man, this places a heavy burden on creators, as well as on those who undergo or encounter in multiple ways their products, whether they be scientific theories, philosophical speculations and analyses, or works of art of all sorts. They are all arise against the background of previous works and received ideas and theories, which both support them as which they which both they, they support as well as they oppose. The nature of this background goes beyond art and theoretical construction to the whole domain of creative making and thinking quite generally. Each artwork or novel theory or ethical proposal or heroic action, independent of scale, makes a claim on our attention as a possible unique and worthwhile instance of a kind of thing with its distinctive defining qualities in the case of artworks, conceptual and empirical contents in the case of a theory, or existential courage in the case of heroic, of heroic action. The interpreter must avoid, must avoid engaging artworks with mere nodding recognition or by imposing a template of prior experiences and the embedded habits of attending that have come to inform us on many levels. And the scientist and experimenter or the writer or artist or philosophical or, or philosopher has to show that their products are truly novel in some essential way, even if they do not break the framework they are operating in, but rather advance it in a way noticeably different than before. So that frames the question by, uh, by burdens to uh, uh, Goethe and some comments from Emerson and some, uh, uh, some other things. Now, but the question is, okay, this is a description from the top, so to speak, uh, or maybe even from the middle. But what lies beneath creativity? What, how would we try to, to detail what is going on underneath these processes or, uh, uh, and generates these events? Goethe and Emerson's way of framing the conditions of creativity and originality seems to both demystify it and to acknowledge it as an ideal, while simultaneously holding it in Emerson's case to be also this petulant demand that in a paradoxical way traps us and binds us. 
Goethe's remarks admittedly have a rather uh, high or sovereign tone to them, perhaps as befits the confident self-knowledge of his Apollonian powers to straddle the divide between the realm of art and the realm of scientific observation and theoretical speculations about nature. Emerson, however, with admittedly mixed motivations, was perplexed and troubled about creativity as a writer in ways quite different from Goethe. There is at its core a religious or existential tone to it, epitomizing his need to uncover or establish the grounds for this original relation to the universe rooted in self-reliance and not on external authority. What Goethe and Emerson share, however, is commitment to a concept of creativity or originality as a free form of thought, action, and self-formation, while admitting at the same time that it is inextricably bound to its background and enabling conditions. It is not reified, nor is it subject to direct control. Consider this phenomenologically thick passage about these conditions from Dewey's artist experience. New ideas come leisurely, he writes, and yet promptly to consciousness only when work has previously been done in forming the right doors by which they may gain entrance. Subconscious maturation precedes creative production in every line of human endeavor. The direct effort of wit and will of itself never gave birth to anything that is not mechanical. Their function is necessary, but it is to let loose a lies that exist outside their scope. At different times, we brood over different things. We entertain purposes that as far as consciousness is concerned are independent, being each appropriate to its own occasion. We perform different acts, each with its own particular result. Yet they all proceed from one living creature. They are somehow bound together below the level of intention. They work together. And finally, something is born almost in spite of conscious personality and certainly not because of its deliberate will. When patience has done its perfect work, the man is taken possession of by the appropriate muse and speaks and sings as some God dictates. Goethe, the, the, uh, Toby Kadui can also wax poetic uh, as, a, as a passage says that that shows us. Peirce remarked about this process that the deeper workings of spirit or psyche take place in their own slow way without our contrivance. Such a passage as Dewey's must not be constricted to canonical artistic or creative processes. It encompasses a description of how in dialogical situations of everydayness, we find new and right words pulled out of us that fit the previously unarticulated think meant, thing meant that we are striving for in order to correspond to the demands of the situation. The educational pedagogical task for schools, for example, is to recognize the ground that has to be prepared and cultivated even for the process of waiting for the felt insight to occur. This uh, reminds me of an anecdote from one of my students many years ago. He came up to me as after my Ways of Knowing class, and he was a physicist, and he said, can I say something to you? And I said, yes, yes, you certainly can. He said, do you do something that is not good? I said, well, that's good to know, too. He said, what is it? He said, when you ask a question in class, he said, you get visibly annoyed when the hands do not shoot up immediately. He said, give us some time. The questions are complicated and the material is complicated. He says, learn to wait a little bit. It's not that we're not following you, that we have to figure out what your question is leading to before we can contribute. And in a certain sense, um, the impatience of the teachers of wanting immediate responses for the students in many respects, I think, is looking for confirmation for themselves and not at all eliciting an insight uh, from, the, uh, from the students. That's not in my text, but it's, I'm reminded of this. Uh, it's a very, uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, comment from the students. A second text from, from Art as Experience moves us to the deep level of creative non-practice, another element in what I've been calling the dialogical depth grammar of creativity. 
Such a grammar is exemplified in art or in theoretical discovery, but by no means restricted to them. Dewey writes, I do not think it can be denied that an element of reverie of approach to a state of dream enters into the creation of a work of art, nor that the experience of the work when it is intense often throws one into a similar state. Indeed, it is safe to say that creative conceptions in philosophy and science come only to persons who are relaxed to the point of reverie. The subconscious fund of meaning stored in our attitudes have no chance of release when we are practically or intellectually strained. For much the greater part of this store is then restrained because the demands of a particular problem and particular purpose inhibit all except the elements directly relevant. Images and ideas come to us not by set purpose, but in flashes, and flashes are intense and illuminating. They set us on fire only when we are free from special preoccupations. Uh, Persians here recognize the, uh, a kind of description of the play of amusement uh, in a more generalized sense uh, that's, uh, that is uh, limbed in this uh, passage from, from Dewey. I would like to cite a third passage, uh, the Dewey passage, bearing upon the scope of alterity or otherness in the dialogical grammar of creativity, the engagement with the other and multiple senses of the word. It generalizes essential aspects of the material dimensions of this grammar and the interactions, indeed dynamic fusion, of inner and outer in creative processes. Such a theme is given illuminating and wide ranging discussion in the architects Christopher Bart's uh, book, Material and Mind, and Yuhani Palasma, the Finnish architect's uh, book, The Thinking Hand. And these works I will comment on a little bit later in the final section of, of this paper. Here's the text from Dewey, the very, very important text. He says, with respect to the physical materials that enter into the formation of a work of art, everyone knows that they must undergo change. Marble must be chipped, pigments must be laid on canvas, words must be put together. It is not so generally recognized that a similar transformation takes place on the side of inner materials, images, observations, memories, and emotions. They are also progressively reformed they too must be administered. This modification is the building up of a truly expressive act. The impulsion that sees as a commotion demanding utterance must undergo as much and as careful management in order to receive eloquent manifestation as marble or pigment, as colors and sounds. Nor are there in fact two operations, one performed upon the outer material and the other upon the inner and mental stuff. The work is artistic in the sense in which the two functions of transformation are affected by a single operation. As the painter places pigment on the canvas or imagines it placed there, his ideas and feelings are also ordered. As the writer, he says, and all of us as philosophers are constantly uh, laying finger to keyboard, uh, not necessarily pen to paper. As the writer composes in his medium of words what he wants to say, his idea takes on for him perceptible form. In this process of interaction with materials and the development of an expressive form or utterance, Dewey holds that the self is modified beyond acquisition of greater facility and skill. Interaction is a process of sedimentation, resulting in a deposit of meaning, involving formation of habits, attitudes, and interests. Dewey, as I have noted, called this condition fundedness as a kind of experiential capital that is constitutive of the self and supports the self, multiple dimensions of noting and caring for things and setting life's purposes. Dewey considers this fundamental of experience to be the key, as I said, of the mind to mind as the background upon which every new contact with surroundings is projected, a notion close to Goethe's and Dewey's own connecting of assimilation and responsive reconstruction. This background is not a passive screen, 
it is a dynamic spiral of reconstruction, assimilation and reconstruction of both background and what is taken in and digested. A central point developed in his classical 1896 essay on the reflex arc concept in psychology. I think most of Dewey's work is in a nutshell in that 1896 paper. You can look at a great part of the rest of his work as, a, as the unfolding of the implications of that 1896 uh, uh, essay. The multidimensional experiential field is a range of material resistances and affordances of oppositional tensions that stimulate the imagination, functioning as enabling conditions for arriving at novel satisfactory consummations, whether affective, practical, aesthetic, political, educational, theoretical, and so forth. Third part, some exemplifications and extensions. Using the language of alchemy, James Elkins in his book, What Painting Is, has given a strong and at times bewildering, but certainly challenging meditation on the materiality of painting. His focus like Nigel Wentworth and his, the phenomenology of painting is, as he says, quote, on the act of painting and the kinds of thought that are taken to be embedded in paint itself. Paint records, he says, the most delicate gesture and the most tense. Painting is an unspoken and largely uncognized dialogue where paint speaks silently in masses and colors and the artist responds in moods. Indeed, Elkins continues, the meanings embedded in painting preserve the motions that generate them. He, he writes, painters can sense these motions in the paint even before they notice what the paintings are about. And so can the properly attuned perceivers of paintings. Winworth gives a nuanced and convincing defense and illustration of the thesis that each material has its own qualitative nature. And this is a theme that runs totally and continuously throughout Dewey's artist experience through his essays on qualitative thought and, affect and on, on affective thought, and in his paper on Peirce's theory of quality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it also, uh, to put a plug in, it's a, it's a key notion in uh, my, uh, the book that, uh, and Randy's series uh, on dimensions of aesthetic and encounters. His analysis of the intertwining of brush, paint, and gesture as material supports of pictorial meaning is complemented by a fine account of the plastic elements of color, line, tone, texture, form, and composition that function on the border between the semiotic and the only seemingly non-semiotic, as well as between expression and figuration. Verbal art, though, admittedly with a different feel, is also embedded in and permeated by language's paradoxical materiality, which is likewise wedded to the power of abstract distancing which uh, uh, Stanley Burnshaw in his book, The Seamless Web, thinks in a certain sense as the kind of permanent original sin of language, uh, that it, it, it both is, is corporal material in joining us and same time as the very source of our abstract distancing from the world. And uh, Burnshaw then thinks of poetry as a way of mediating and, 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 and bringing the uh, uh, language and the world back together again in a participatory way. It's a very, it's fantastic, fantastically deep book and it's a, a very provocative book to read. In his book, Making, the cultural anthropologist, Tim Engel writes of an improvisory creativity that quote, works things out as it goes along. In contrast to what he says, the attribution of creativity to the novelty of determinate ends conceived in advance which only have to then be realized. Certainly language mediated dialogues exhibit such improvisory character, even in the domain of inner speech as the Russian psychologist Vygotsky showed, where he talked about the flow of word and counter word and the felt traces of contrary tendencies in the field of consciousness, a phenomenon that James also very clearly explored in the chapters on, on the field of consciousness uh, and the principles. 
Clearly, there are also times when the ends are determinant by reason of an experimentally foreseen interaction of materials, and there are times when the end is only attained when one recognizes that a process of interaction has come to a conclusion that feels right or corresponds to a sense of completion, such as finding the right word to dissolve what seems a radical disagreement or thereby to create a sense of comity or fellowship as social bond or the realization that a poem is finished or that the last stroke has been applied to a canvas or the line drawn on paper or there can be no sense of completion, but one has one at the end of fracture and rupture. So that, the, the, uh, that is the, the ultimate conclusion of what one is of writing, a simple breaking off of putting down, of putting down the pen. Engold argues and shows with the wealth of examples that making in the sense of which his, he is using the terms must be understood longitudinally as a confluence of forces and materials, a form generating or morphogenetic process. Engold thinks of both organisms and artifacts in dynamic terms as growing, as embodied matrices of processes. What an organism has in mind is to be sure quite different from the varying degrees of human involvement and the making of an artifact. Engold makes an indispensable point when he writes, quote, even if the maker has a form in mind, it is not this form that creates the work. It is engagement with materials. Is this not also the case of, the case, uh, of speech and its essentially dialogical nature? Language too involves active transformation of material, funded semiotic material that supports and mediates the utterance that is appropriate and fitting to the dialogical situations in which we find ourselves and engage one another, whether writer, artist, architect, teacher, or politician. For Ingold, learning is understanding and practice, exploring the interrelations between perception, creativity, and skill. It is not the fostering of creativity dependent on developing frameworks for various practices, educational, political, communal, and so forth, that aim principally at the development of perception and skill and not explicitly or directly at creativity. The, ongoing per the perceived ongoing possibilities of materials in the broadest sense and of dialogical encounters with them in diverse situations both singularly and in groups, provoke self-reflection on their successes and on the interruptions and lack of focus attendant on their failure. Such skills involve what Michael Polanyi called tacit knowledge, but entail and entail a subsidiary, not focal knowledge of the maxims that perform, that inform our activities and how we manage to go on with them with an accompanying sense of being on the right track. Ingold, in the discussion of building in early of building in early society, refers to what he calls creativity of messy practices that give rise to real buildings, a theme treated with concrete nuance by Palasma in The Thinking Hand. Architecture, he writes, is a product of the knowing hand. The hand grasps, he says, the phys physicality and materiality of thought and turns it into a concrete image. In the arduous process of, of designing, the hand often takes the lead in probing for a vision, a vague inkling that it eventually turns into a sketch, a materialization of an idea. Messy practices mark the whole realm of dialogical interactions, which have not a stable, but a dynamic and often really unstable center embedded in a field of forces. Messy practices involve starting and stopping, interruptions, extended pauses, diversions, attempts at domination and control, and so forth. Messy practices, it sounds like a, a political order, as a matter of fact, what, that, what, we just, what those particular characteristics. Indeed, texts and ordered conversations 
works of art, democracy, and the institutions and practices of schooling emerge out of and are examples of such messy practices. These practices are always confronted by what Polanyi and another called in another context referred to as a logical gap between where one is situated and where one is heading to, although one cannot get a firm grip on it before crossing the gap. In such situations which mark life itself, crossing the gap is not principally a feat of action, but an event into which we are caught up and to which we can indeed must accommodate ourselves. Creativity is clearly a process too, involving our being embodied in dynamic and field of uh, and a dynamic heuristic field of forces. Looked at semiotically, as cultural psychologists do and semioticians quite generally, it is activity undertaken in already formed cultural meaning fields, including fields of materials and material objects, whose possibilities afford as well as resist creative transformations by technology and the arts. Looked at practically, it is a field of possible and appropriate social actions, including the core political and educational context of our lives. But creativity is also an event that seems to spring from nowhere. Some have described this nowhere as the unconscious, or as we have seen in Dewey's case, the subconscious, which is perhaps a more neutral term. Creativity as an event cannot be willed or controlled, although there are certain practices of various sorts that facilitate it. It cannot be constructed like a house or a wall from a plan worked out in detail beforehand, but even these plans become embroiled in messy practices as we find where, as we find in, even in the high technology uh, building processes. Kaina Lesky, this is a very interesting book by Kaina Lesky, L-E-S-K-I. She's a professor of architecture at Rhode Island School of Design, um, wrote a very interesting book called uh, The Storm of Creativity. Um, and uh, she writes about uh, uh, her pedagogical uh, assignments to her in her design class of how she gives students uh, uh, various types of materials and then gives them a task to do something with it that will illustrate X, Y, or Z, but she doesn't, they say, how can I possibly do this? How can I illustrate a Kandinsky painting by using a fiberboard, uh, uh, a pile of fiberboard and, and sharp knives? Uh, but she says that the creative process comes from displacing, disturbing, and destabilizing what you think you know. The creative process comes from displacing, disturbing, and destabilizing what you think you know. These preconceptions, which we can perhaps think of more generally as four structures, paradoxically both foster and hinder creativity. Preconceptions are not just in our head. They are also habits of feeling, tendencies to act, the stubborn and temperamental material that we cannot leave behind, that are clung to by means of those practices that make up what Peirce called in his fixation of belief, the method of tenacity. Forgetting is difficult, Lesky points out, citing Ortega y Cosset, that the culture in which we have been formed can become a guarantor of a deceptive safety, burdened with parasitic and lymphatic matter. Creativity or creative action is marked, she says, by the effort to try and see ahead while be, being deeply conditioned by the past and its traditional methods and concepts, which are both exploited and overcome. Here's the last uh, two paragraphs. I ran across a sentence um, uh, about the pianist Hélène Grimaud uh, while preparing this paper that uh, captures another aspect, I think, of the bound nature of creativity that perhaps applies to all of us who are connected with the world of homo academicus, with its complex relations between teaching established contents and the putative production of new ideas. She has, she writes about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Anti Tomasini who's writing uh, uh, this uh, uh, about uh, Grimaud. It's, here's what the text says. She has this willingness to take a piece of music apart and free herself from the general body of practice that has grown up around it. She has this willingness 
to take a piece of music apart and free herself from the general body of practice that has grown up around it, or the philosopher taking a text apart, or the literary critic taking a text apart, or, what, or whatever it, it would be. The music world in its great diversity has come to distinguish multiple roles for its practitioners. There are composers, performers, and conductors. These roles clearly can be fused in certain circumstances and have a long history of shifting relations and ascription of status. In Guimau's case, she is a classical pianist with a broad repertory and deep familiarity with the general body of practice that marks not just music, but art, science, and philosophy. I am especially moved by her performance of recorded in Berlin of Ferruccio Busoni's transcription of what the Times music critic Anthony Tomasini contended was not a descript transcription, but the rather a visionary reconstruction or piano of the Chocon from Bach's partita for solo violin number two. Busoni, however, took upon himself this reconstruction of something that is still, after the reconstruction, identifiable as Bach Chocon. So we can recognize the piano piece as, as Busoni, but it's Busoni's Bach. So Bach shines through it, and but Busoni at the same time has reconfigured it for a totally different instrument, which gives very, very different technical uh, uh, exigencies to the pianist, etc. At the same time, I said, though, the work itself is accessed for those of us who are not pianists or readers of the score through Grimaud's performance. And in many cases, our experience is mixed with memories of his performance on the violin by various violinists, that is, in its original version. In our broad, uh, this is the last paragraph, in our broad philosophical, scientific, and artistic endeavors then, are we not challenged to take apart by attentive critical appropriation the vitally important topics we are drawn to? locating them in the general body of practices out of which they have emerged and been shaped and giving voice to them in new ways? Is this not the type of task that the paradoxical, even petulant demand for and recognition of an intrinsically indebted originality and creativity imposes upon us? Does Pascal perhaps have something to say about a feeling most of us have had at some time in our lives? perhaps in the, even in the course of preparing our papers for conferences or discussing them around the table, whether in the bar afterwards to recover from four hours around the table or have been realizing that it's better to go to another round table than to stay at the table we were at. This is what Pascal says in his Pensee. He says, let no one say that I have said nothing new. The arrangement of the material is new. In playing tennis, both players use the same ball, but one plays it better. I would just as soon be told that I have used old words as if the same thoughts did not form a different argument by being differently arranged, just as the same words make different thoughts when arranged differently. Thank you. <laughs> some uh, rich material for us to uh, consider and mull over. Yeah, let's start with what Nick has to say. I'll read Nick's question here. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Bob. Your presentation hits on big ideas and topics that fit perfect with some of my own current work. Parenthetically, no surprise as usual. Question. Emerson Shakespeare essay is okay for pointing out the imperfect nature of the poetic genius, quotations, her non-pure originality, as is keeping with representative men. But Emerson's best discussion on creativity is the poet. What do you think of it? More specifically, mm -hmm. what do you make of the metaphysical, cosmological, and parenthetically, neoplatonic in form, story of creativity there. It articulates the poet's movement in an emanating universe of evolving, growing, progressive, original semiotic structures. 
I'm partly motivated to ask you this because I find reading Emerson through Dewey to sacrifice Emerson's transcendentalism, which, for one, includes a powerful metaphysics of art. That's a long question. <laughs> Hang on to... Okay, Nick. Yes, I, 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 I know what you mean about the... Uh, uh, why read uh, Emerson through the, uh, the, the, the essay on Shakespeare uh, and uh, not on the poet. And as a matter of fact, for years in my language science and symbols course, uh, the, we, all re we, we always read the poet. And uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, in uh, one class, uh, uh, one, one, to one iteration of the course, I made the last class where I, I in a sense, uh, acted out the essay on the poet. Uh, and uh, so the students saw that to, to a great degree, many of the themes we had talked about in the course of the, of the semester, uh, dealing with um, uh, uh, languages of transcendence, uh, creativity, the role of metaphor, uh, the Neoplatonic aspects of, of, of things uh, were, uh, were, were are, are articulated. I think you're right about uh, uh, that uh, reading Emerson through Dewey sacrifices Emerson's transcendentalism. Uh, uh, and I have read your book very carefully. As a matter of fact, I, I have cited it, uh, uh, several passages of it uh, uh, elsewhere. And, and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, I, even in, uh, I'm pretty sure, I don't have it with me here, the index, but I'm pretty sure there's a reference to it in my, in my book. Uh, but I know in a, a large paper that I published on, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, on uh, the Bloomsbury Companion to Persian, contemporary Persian semiotics, there is a large, uh, uh, there is a section, uh, uh, several pages that deal with issues that you yourself have, have raised. So I, I, am, I am aware of that. Uh, it, would, it would take a long time to, to, uh, uh, to, to figure out to what degree uh, we should sacrifice Emerson's transcendentalism or how we are to understand uh, it is a residuum of, 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 of existential positions that Dewey at the end did not want to sustain. Uh, and and uh, it's very clear that uh, the Dewey did not have any uh, real use uh, for that, even though it's very clear he also uh, was a good reader of, of Emerson. But there was a deconstruction of Emerson, of, of course, and as, as Dewey uh, assimilated him. So that would be how I would, I would uh, very briefly answer that question. I actually have one because uh, at about... Um, five different points in your talk, I found myself going off on my own creative. I, I'm not the only one. I see people nodding. <laughs> I, you, you said something about five different times that sent me off on my own sort of creative thought. And then I had to sort of rejoin you later after, after I had had my creative thought. And each time I did it, I thought, oh, I should ask a question about that. But it's gone now. And so my question is, Bob, why is it gone? <laughs> you, will find that, you will find that out when you wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> you, can, you can go on about it. It will wake, it will wake you up at 2.45 tomorrow morning, and you will not be able to get back to sleep when they will all be uh, part of you. Uh, well, this really comes from the second part of your paper on those sort of like underlying processes that uh, yeah. that, uh, that 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 they just sort of twist and roil um, uh, uh, around beneath the level of sort of uh, reflective consciousness for sure, but even even consciousness itself, and and they're so ephemeral, and yet in their moment so clear. You you mentioned yeah. this, and so in their moment, it's it's so clear, and yet I don't know what to say about what I'm thinking, right? And so I'm just I'm I'm, I'm trying to s encourage you to say more about that that sort of moment. I, I agree with you that it's going to wake me up at two forty five. 
Well, one thing could be that you've already thought a lot of these, that you have thought these topics are already through. So in a certain sense, the, uh, there's not so much a shock of the new, but a shock of recognition of something that, that, you, already, that you already hold to. So in a certain sense, there would be no need for you to, uh, to remember your questions because in a certain sense, you already uh, had assimilated them to uh, a, a proposed set of answers. Uh, That's true. I, I, I'll, give you an I'll give you an example. We, we were recently, I was recently in Atlanta for a, for a meeting and um, uh, where the, the papers were not, uh, were not read, they were not, you did not give a lecture, you had to summarize your paper. I had to try to summarize this paper in eight or nine, eight or nine minutes. And then uh, ultimately all the papers had been read before. So you had then discussion. And uh, when I got home after the, uh, the four days, my, uh, I was in the very first session with a, a painter, a person who is a painter and a professor of philosophy. Um, um, uh, the Megan Craig, I'm pretty sure you probably know, uh, know her work. She teaches at Stony Brook. Uh, and there was um, uh, uh, an, another person and uh, Richard Schusterman. There were four of us, Schusterman, myself, Megan, and another person. And uh, the, uh, when I got home, I, I said, well, how, how, you know, I talked to her, obviously. She said, how did, how did, how, how, how did the, other, the other two other person Go, the one you have not talked about. And I said, well, who was that? And I said, I can't remember. I can't remember. Because there was, there was really not much of a, of even a summary. And that really embarrassed me. I said, this is it. I have to see a neurologist. Uh, this does this, this is not, this is not working. So I ran upstairs and grabbed my folder, and now I and I realized why I did not remember it because the, the, the presentation was danced. It was illustrated. Uh, the point of the paper dealt with a, with with a kind of body logic of movement, and of of this, and I had simply blotted blotted it out because the content was completely visual and was not conceptual. Although the, the conceptual content came out of our experiencing what had been done. So I, I, perhaps that is an analogy of, 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 of or, or a parallel to what you yourself, uh, uh, the experience that you underwent when you were checking off those five points of, uh, or whatever, however many they would have been that would uh, that dealt with this. Uh, I don't know whether that's a, a, the type of answer uh, you had wanted, but many of us um, uh, have had similar uh, experiences of, of uh, of immediate, immediate absorption and recognition without a, a sense of, of, of complete difference or a significant difference. Uh, yeah, that's, that's very helpful. I, I see that Julian Clark has a question. Uh, Sabrina, is that a question for you or there's another one in the chat? Let's do Julian's and then move on to, uh, uh, to uh, what's in the chat. Okay, I, I hope I can be <laughs> Thank you so much, Bob, for your very illuminating talk. There are very, th very short three questions that I would have for you. Now for Goethe and for Emerson, would there really be like true originality? Is there a thing like something novel that artists can actually do? Is there real novelty? That is the first question. Huh. The second one is an annotation for the third part of your paper, maybe. I would like to mm. suggest that you also look at Karl Joachim Friedrich and his concept of Schöpferische Zerstörung, so the creative destruction of technology and economics, that any technology always follows after the other, um, but actually also builds up on prior achievements, because, for example, there are still telegrams around. We do write mails today, but there are also telegrams. But on the other hand, they're pushed aside. That's what he meant with really creative destruction. And now the last point that I wondered about, could we say that for 
Goethe than and for Amazon. Creativity is always situated in some context. So mm. I do not mean to say that it's determined, also not by prior creative thinkers or artists, but that it's pre-configured by certain conditions. And that actually also brings me back to the first question, is there then really, if it's actually pre-configured, is there an actually novelty possible in arts, but also in philosophical thinking? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Donald Crosby wrote a very interesting book that was published by SUNY on novelty. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting book where he goes through novelty. He's working more out of process philosophy or a, a, a modified version of process philosophy of saying that uh, novelty is, is uniform, uh, distributed throughout nature. But uh, novelty is also connected with the principle of continuity. And, and the continuity of processes, if they are not antecedently determined, uh, are a mark of the, of the generation of a, of a free space um, um, uh, in, 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 for natural processes to begin with in biology and, in, and uh, perhaps in, in physics, etc. But when you get to the other scales, say in intellectual philosophical, the history of philosophical texts or, or the anxiety of influence that say Bloom writes about, of, you know, people saying, uh, I, I wanna kill all my, all my antecedents. There will be, I wanna write the book or the paper that makes any other paper or any other book about this topic irrelevant or unnecessary. Not so much irrelevant, but unnecessary. So how do you uh, how do you sort of manage to live with this this petulant demand <laughs> to have the last word or or the last new concept, etc.? I give you another example. Um, the, everybody's made this enormous amount of out of uh, the analytic philosophers have made enormous amount of of whatever you want to call it, you can add a noun that you want, about language games and, and, and family resemblances and synchitic concepts and all of those various things in Wittgenstein. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Wittgenstein, I wrote a book about the student that uh, a, a professor in Vienna that uh, Wittgenstein studied with and hated. It was Carl Bueller the great psychologist of language. And, and, um, uh, and I, I, I wrote a book about Bueller and uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the, the notion of the open texture of concepts, of family resemblances, the impractic use of language, all those things that the analytic philosophers have made a big deal of, um, uh, and rightly so, uh, are were already there, embedded in in in, in Bueller's and 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 his other and, and his other writings, and uh, likewise the whole notion of speech acts and uh, and, and those sort of things came um, uh, that uh, that uh, was considered so novel of the social matrix of language and language as his field of actions and all of these things. Uh, um, were already uh, 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 illustrated very clearly in Philip Wegener's uh, 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 19th, century, 19th century book on the grand principles, fundamental principles of the, of the theory of language and uh, on language as emendation, as constant self-correction, so that, that articulations are articulations and situations that make reconfigure the situation that you're talking about in a general, as a result, generate the, uh, the, the topic further on uh, and, and, and reconfigure it. And I think this is a problem that all of us are faced. I have to tell you, they're trying to do this. Uh, when I did this paper, I had already written it. And I, the last five, five years from 2015, 2019, I had an appointment in Denmark as an Obel Foundation visiting professor at the Niels Bohr Center for Cultural Psychology. And 
it was a perfect place. It was a perfect place to go um, uh, for, for more reasons than one, since my wife is a Dane, and so she was very close to her family. But um, um, uh, the, a number of the, of the topics we took up dealt with these, these points of, 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 of intersection of, of trying to find new ways of saying the same thing, but then all of a sudden those new ways change the thing. And if, if philosophers who are trying to reconstruct um, the philosophical tradition and move on, realize that, that uh, moving on always means either fixing a defect and an adequate understanding of a, of a topic or a theme or, or simply going beyond it, that there was nothing to fix, but there was a, an unexplained set of possibilities that were revealed by, 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 by sets of texts. So if you take, um, you, but you can go back to philosophy and think of what the process philosophers did with, uh, and the process theologians did with Whitehead, uh, who, <laughs> The, the Whitehead's God was not the God of these of the Christian theologians. The Christian theologians then began reconfiguring uh, their uh, their their ideas of divinity, etc. And in the ways, Bob Neville, of course, whom I knew, I've known for over almost sixty years now. Uh, uh, you know, I've known him from all the way back to New York in nineteen the middle of the nineteen sixties. But not just him. All the others who belong to that to that tradition have uh, ha are doing exactly that. But when you measure them together, they don't all fully agree. Donald Crosby left, uh, you know, walked out of the theistic frame while maintaining the religious frame of of of, of process naturalism. So um, uh, it's a it's a very complicated issue of how we're related to the tradition and to reconstructing it and of of um of uh of 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 of, 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 of not so much trying to say something new but finding that we end up doing it without the effort of wit and will that uh that uh, dewey that dewey that talks about and i said i had this problem uh, writing this paper but i had even more trouble that landed on my doorstep when a, a group of my Brazilian friends who are cultural psychologists wrote and said, we have this book that we're getting ready to send to Palgrave and we want you to write a chapter that is, functions as a commentary on three of the chapters, but use a chapter in itself that comments on the three chapters. Well, it, uh, that was not exactly what I had in mind in my plan, but I could not say no to them. So my problem then was the same. You have three formulations dealing with the dialogical nature of creativity. What was I going to say about them? Well, the fact is you have to try to figure out where they intersect with one another. And then at what point one had, one had found the voice that was both a commentary and an independent set of, ex, of, of extensions. And I think in philosophy, that's obviously the case. And in the history of theology, that has very clearly uh, been the, the case. And um, in multiple traditions, you have the same, we have the same problem of uh, tradition and discovery. Uh, um, Polanyi's, um, there's a, the Polanyi group has a, a small journal called Tradition and Discovery which sort of, I think, pinpoints the, one of the, uh, the, uh, the um, main focal points, one of the main tension points of, of, of the type of things that are illustrated in this, uh, in this, uh, 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 in this, in this paper. Uh, but um, uh, there, I mean, obviously, if we could go to, we're too far away to go to a bar now, because by the time we arrived there, uh, they would be closed. Uh, since I thousand miles away from you, but uh, that would be the best way I could answer Julian's, uh, the implications of Julian's question. Uh, we can uh, have Sabrina relate whatever the question in the chat is, and uh, I think we've got time for that, and uh, we'll see after your answer as to whether we've got time for more. All right. Okay. 
The next question in the chat is from Mark Anderson. Mm -hmm. Sorry I missed the beginning of the talk, but from where I joined, there seemed a tension between creative non-practice as waiting and creativity at the level of, for example, the hand of an artist. So can it be reconciled in something like sport, say hockey or basketball, etc., where we see some incredibly creative moving quick lost my line, where we see some incredibly creative moving quick time by one of the greats without the waiting? Or is the waiting proportional to the time in which the sport is played? <laughs> Good luck with this, Bob. Uh, however, I do want to add to Mark's question that when you were talking about Dewey's creative non-practice, that was one of the moments that I took off. <laughs> it's really, it's one of the most interesting ideas ever. But um, uh, sports, as the greats don't have to wait. <laughs> right. <laughs> they don't have time to wait. Yes, but the, the whole notion of, of, of latent, the latency is there. Because the 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 the, uh, the 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 skill becomes a proper background of a reconfigured body that it makes the move directly uh, uh, in response to all the other moves, and in that sense, uh, the the the, um, the 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 the. The hockey player, the hockey shot, or the or the quick move by the by the basketball player, or the the final uh, 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 adjustment uh, that would be needed by a football player, or whatever the case may be, uh, is a form of, of 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 latent tacit knowledge, as opposed to anything that's explicitly rule governed. Uh, the recovery, if if you think, if you take the case of tennis of somebody like Djokovic, uh, who uh, as, as a returner of serves, uh, uh, I mean, I haven't played tennis for years, but I, uh, there's something about Djokovic that enables him to recover from the most awkward positions in a creative, in a creative manner. And uh, that is a kind of, um, uh, of, of not so much creative non-practice because he's not waiting, although he is waiting for the serve. But the response, the structure of the response is uh, something that can appear in multiple exemplars. And, and as a result, uh, it's not that he can only make one move in response to these serves, and it affects every possible situation, but that each situation is prepared by uh, is is prepared to be dealt with as it comes. So that is part of the eager uh, background, I think, reconfigured in motoric terms that uh, Dewey was referring to, and and but many others who have dealt with this too. Herigel's book on Zen and the Art of Archery and those things. Uh, deal with these 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 issues in the in in the same in this in the in the in, in this in the same way, uh, but a number of things occur by accident. If you read the books on the history of discovery, of of uh, uh, of, of simply waiting, uh, there's a lot of anecdotes in Adamar's book on the uh, psychology of creative discovery of. Uh, such as the discovery of the chemical structure of benzene or Poincaré uh, solving heavy mathematical problems without even thinking of them because uh, he thought he couldn't solve them. So he forgets about them and he steps up on a streetcar in Paris and the, the solution to his problem uh, emerges for him there too. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that type of insight comes to the person who is truly prepared but is not prepared necessarily at any one point to answer any one particular question. But the question gets answered by circumstances that evoke 
uh, the answer, whether it's a motoric gesture or a movement in dance or, or, or uh, uh, recovery from a fall uh, uh, off of a cliff or whatever it would, whatever it would be. Um, okay. So it is time for a break. It's time to eat. If you're uh, hungry, it's time to drink. If you're thirsty, it's time to pee if, well, if you need to. All right, uh, we'll, we'll carry on here in the next few minutes. Thank you so much, Bob.